next week, right? Because um, after that, I mean during this week, uh, because next week we will be going through the solutions in class. And it's of little use uh, uh, to see the solutions if you haven't tried uh, solving the problems uh, yourselves. So please try to find time so that uh, to, to uh, solve as many of the problems as possible on your own and then we will go very carefully um, over the problems in, in lectures, <coughs> kind of trying to analyze each step uh, what took to, to solve the problem um, and kind of trying to abstract this and uh, so that you get a general idea that you can apply to any problem including the ones that you will see on the final. So <coughs> the last segment is about linear programming um, and uh, uh, the algorithm that solves uh, linear uh, programming problems. There are several of them. Uh, the most popular one is the so-called simplex uh, algorithm. Um, and there is also there are also some kind of uh, trickier uh, uh, trickier algorithms uh, in, uh, internal uh, points algorithm um, because uh, simplex is actually not guaranteed uh, to run in uh, uh, polynomial time uh, unlike uh, in, uh, um, the other uh, more advanced uh, algorithms but in practice performs extremely well. Uh, so let's see, so we will not go, I will post the, the details of the simplex algorithm in lecture notes on the web page later today, <coughs> but we will not go through it. Uh, the point will be to explain to you um, how to formulate, how to translate problems into linear programming problems in a form that um, uh, uh, that um, uh, software packages uh, expect to see uh, as input, right? Uh, be this um, uh, simplex or interior points um, algorithms. So, what is linear programming? So, here is <coughs> a uh, problem that uh, you want to solve. So, um, so assume that you are given a list of food sources. <coughs> you can think of uh, Woolworth's uh, inventory when it comes to food, and so there are n uh, food staples, right? And for each source, uh, Fi, you are given its price per gram. Uh, PI, right? So it's the price of that food. Uh, so then you are given the number of calories per gram. Um, and uh, for each of the 13 vitamins uh, that human body needs, you are given the content in milligrams. So VIJ is the content of vitamin VJ in the food source Fi. So what is your task? Your task is to find a combination of quantities of food sources such that the following is satisfied. The total number of calories in all of the chosen food, in the amounts that you chose, is equal to recommended daily value of 2,000 calories. Uh, well, let's make it 4,000 calories for some of us. Um, so the second constraint is that the total intake of each vitamin uh, Vj is at least uh, the recommended daily intake uh, Vj, this is well known, right? How many milligrams of each vitamin we need a day, right? And uh, 
if uh, the shopping is done by my wife, then the uh, price of all food per day should be as small as possible, as low as possible, right? So you can see this is a, <coughs> a kind of very natural uh, problem, and you can replace uh, here uh, food with, uh, say, uh, different stocks, right, that have different expected returns, uh, and you want to, for example, maximize uh, uh, the yield of your portfolio. So this is one type of problem that you see uh, here when you want to, uh, you want to minimize certain objective. Uh, there is a, a dual class of problems in which you want to maximize the objective given uh, certain constraints. For example, uh, here if uh, the objective is the cost, you want to minimize it while meeting all the constraints. But for example, if you are <coughs> deciding how you should invest your man money in various uh, stocks and other financial instruments, then of course you want to maximize your expected return given uh, the constraints um, of uh, how much money you have and uh, how you want to uh, distribute it. So here is another... <coughs> um, so how do we write this? Um, so the total number of calories, right, is equal if Xi is the amount in grams of a food staple Fi, then the calorie content of that of that many grams of uh, the food Fi will be Xi times Ci, because remember Ci is the calories per gram. And you want this to be equal to 2,000, right? Because that's uh, average uh, uh, necessary intake in calories uh, for an average human. Um, and then you want for each vitamin Vj, right? And there are 13 of them, right? Um, you want that the content, so if Xi is the amount of food Fi, and each gram of uh, uh, food uh, Fi contains uh, J milligrams of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I milligrams of, uh, um, of vitamin J, then the total <coughs> intake of that vitamin will be this sum, right? No, amount of in grams of food I times the content per gram of the vitamin J in that food, right? So, um, of course, <coughs> there is an implicit assumption here that all the quantities uh, must be non-negative numbers, right? You cannot uh, eat a negative amount, uh, negative number of grams of uh, uh, food. Uh, which I am trying to explain to my wife for quite a while, but uh, um, our goal is to minimize the objective function, which is the uh, number of grams of each, or um, amount, not number, but just amount in grams, it can be fractional, right, of uh, food Fi times the price of food uh, Pi, so you want to minimize the total cost while meeting all these constraints, right? Uh, notice <coughs> what is important here, which makes this problem a special case of linear programming problem, is that both the objective and all of the constra constra constraints are linear functions. They are, the constraints are inequalities whose uh, one of the sides involves a linear uh, function in terms of the unknown variables, right? So, for example, here xi cannot be squared or some other function applied to it. It has to be just a linear combination because v, i, j are constants, so this is just a linear combination of the variables. Some of the constraints can be equalities, right? So it's either linear combination equal to something or linear combination greater or smaller than something. 
<coughs> and uh, in this particular problem, we can assume that all variables are positive. Okay, um, so here is another problem. So assume that you are either a treasurer or shadow treasurer, and you want to make certain promises uh, to the electorate. Uh, of course, you have no obligation to fulfill the promises, but that's another story. Uh, you want to make certain promises to the electorate, which will ensure that your party will win in the forthcoming uh, elections. Uh, I thought I removed all these subversive messages, uh, subliminal subversive messages, uh, that uh, somehow people might think that uh, I don't like our democracy. <laughs> Did I tell you my favorite joke about democracy? <clears throat> okay, so you have these four guys uh, <coughs> that are studying to become, well, depending on your Preferences, you can choose either to become priests or rabbis or mullahs, right? And it happens that, you know, they read the holy book, and it happens always that uh, three of them uh, say, uh, oh, this is what God meant to say, and the fourth guy says, no, 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 this is not what God meant, and he gives an alternative view. And the three guys say, ah, Nonsense. Three of us, you alone, we are majority, we must be right. right. And the guy gets desperate and says, God, please give them a sign that I am right. Suddenly the earth starts shaking, right? The three guys say, ah, look, it's just an earthquake. Three of us, you alone, we are majority, we are right, shut up. Okay. So they keep reading the Bible further. The same story happens again, and the guy grows even more desperate. And he says, oh, God, please give them a sign that I am right. right? Suddenly, the sun disappears. Right? The three guys say, ah, it's just an eclipse. Three of us, you alone, we are majority, shut up. So finally, the guy, the, the guy gets, this guy gets totally desperate. And he says, oh, God, please give them a sign. I am right. Suddenly the sky opens and you hear this voice, he is right. <laughs> the three guys say, well, okay, let's see. Three of us, two of you, we are majority, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> okay. With these subversive messages, this time it wasn't subliminal, it was uh, explicit. Okay. So you can promise to build several things, right? Certain number of bridges, each just three, million, three billion apiece, right? Then you can promise to build a certain number of rural airports, each two billion apiece, and a certain number of Olympic swimming pools, each just a billion apiece, right? So now, uh, your advisors tell you that each bridge you promise will bring you 5% of city votes, 7% of suburban votes, and say 9% of rural votes. On the other hand, if each rural airport you promise to bring um, brings you no city votes, because why should we care about these buggers that live uh, uh, in desolate parts of Australia? Uh, on the other hand, uh, 2% of suburban votes, and of course, 15% of rural votes, because these people are the most concerned to have airports. Finally, each Olympic swimming pool brings you 12% of city votes, right? Because Olympic swimming pools are built in cities. 3% of suburban votes, and of course, no rural votes. Now, in order to win the election, you have to get at least 51% of each of the city votes, suburban votes, and rural votes. And you wish to win the election by cleverly making a promise that appears that will blow as small hole in the budget as possible, which is uh, uh, when the governments nowadays, when they promise that they will do something, it only means that they will increase the, the debt, right? So you want to kind of make it appear that uh, um, the 
the budget deficit that you are, will cause will be just awful, but not catastrophic. Okay, so, <coughs> so let the number of bridges to be built be XB, right? The number of airports XA and the number of swimming pools XP. So, the, so what is the, because the price of uh, each bridge is three billion, price of each airport two billion, and price of each swimming pool is one billion, you want to minimize this objective, right? Because you want to <coughs> promise something that is as cheap or at least at the least expensive option, but you want to make sure that the following is satisfied, uh, that the number of uh, um, uh, votes that you will get uh, in the city will be 0.05 XB, right? Because we know that 5%, each bridge brings you 5% of the votes. Uh, no airport, uh, airports don't bring you anything, and uh, swimming pool be, bring you 12% of the city votes, and you want this to be bigger than 51. Uh, similarly, for the suburban votes, for the suburban guys, each bridge brings you 7%. Uh, each uh, uh, airport brings you 2%, and each uh, swimming pool brings you 3% of the... Uh, suburban votes, and you want this to be bigger than 51%. And similarly for the rural votes, and of course all the variables should be um, non-negative, right? Zero or positive. So this is an example where you want to minimize this objective, right? Subject to these constraints. So that's another example how to formulate how to translate a practical problem into a linear programming problem. But these two problems, and Emily, one with the food, with minimizing the cost of your diet, and the one with these electoral promises are fundamentally different. Can you see the difference? What's the difference between this problem and the previous problem with uh, food staples. So you want to minimize the total price by choosing how much of each food staple you will buy. How much, right? On the other hand, in the second problem, you want to minimize uh, the price by choosing how many bridges, how many airports, and how many swimming pools. What's the difference between how much of each food staple and how many of uh, airports, bridges, and so forth? Discreteness, exactly. You cannot promise that you will uh, build three and a half bridges. Right? Even though even this wouldn't surprise me nowadays, but... <laughs> um, so... Um, so the, the first problem asks for a solution that is any, uh, any um, real number, any non-negative uh, real number. The second solution has to be in integers. And so the second problem is uh, an instance of integer linear programming problem, which requires all the solutions to be integers. And guess what? Um, you see, discrete is actually a more of a straight jacket than just requiring uh, um, real number solutions. Uh, this, the, the, the second problem is actually um, an example of an NP-hard problem, right? So there, is, there can be no feasible algorithm to solve 
this uh, um, uh, type of integer linear programs, uh, but uh, there is a, a feasible algorithm to solve a real, uh, real valued uh, linear programming problems. Maybe I should tell you an interesting story. So the um, simplex method that solves uh, real valued linear programming problems was uh, 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 the solution, the as algorithm that solves it was discovered early in the 20th century and used extensively in, for example, logistics, in economics, but uh, it, people were aware that uh, theoretically this algorithm might not run in polynomial time. However, to make it not run in polynomial time required very devious kind of and quite artificial um, uh, trick to find uh, examples of linear uh, programming problems that would defy, that couldn't, that uh, simplex would run in exponential time. Um, in practice, it always kind of worked, right? And then, I believe in mid-50s, a Russian mathematician actually found a method uh, called the ellipsoid method to solve uh, linear programming problems in polynomial time. Now, interestingly enough, even though the algorithm was guaranteed to work in polynomial time, I think in the fourth power of the size of the problem, uh, in practice, actually, simplex was faster than uh, the ellipsoid method, but clever mathematicians in the United States uh, realize that they can use this discovery to get more funding for their research. So what they did, uh, they organized a scare campaign and uh, told the American government that the Russians are inventing these super fast algorithms that can, uh, you know, make them build probably better nukes or whatever. And lo and behold, the uh, American government shelled more money uh, for mathematics, which is uh, a nice application of mathematics in real life, right? <laughs> so, um, so uh, as I said, we will not go through the details of the simplex algorithm, but I will put on the class website uh, uh, later today uh, lecture notes that go through all the details of the simplex algorithm. It's uh, rather, uh, it's quite an intuitive algorithm that walks along the edges of the simplex, in fact, that is defined by the constraints, um, always essentially greedily trying to optimize the solution. Um, so, uh, but what we want to see here is just how to bring a uh, um, problem into a form that uh, the software packages uh, uh, that implement various uh, solvers like MATLAB or Mathematica and many others uh, can actually understand. So the standard form of a linear program is uh, the objective is given as a linear combination of variables and uh, essentially this is represented just by the vector of the coefficients. Uh, um, and the constraints are, if this is to be maximized, the constraints are smaller or equal. If this is to be minimized, then the constraints will be always bigger or uh, equal, plus additional constraint that all variables will be positive. Um, so to get a more compact representation, let, we will introduce a partial ordering among vectors of length n. And we will say that vector x is smaller or equal than vector y if every coordinate of x, so every xi, 
is smaller or equal than yi, right? So clearly that's a not uh, total ordering because you can have uh, uh, two vectors so that the first coordinate of the first is larger than the first coordinate of the second, but second coordinate of the first is smaller than the second coordinate of the second, right? So this is only a partial uh, ordering, but it will do the job for, uh, for the purpose here. Okay, uh, so uh, as I said, the objective will be encoded just by the uh, vector of the coefficients, right? And if you encode vectors as uh, columns, right, uh, then uh, you have to transpose it here so that uh, when you multiply CT with X, uh, you, this is just a scalar product with, between the coefficients and X. So this uh, literally is just a sum, so just imagine um, after you uh, transpose a column vector, right? If you transpose a column vector, you will get a row vector. So this will be the vector of the coefficients uh, C. So this is C transposed because it's written as a row. And then you have X, which is a column vector. Right? And if you treat them as matrices, right, then you multiply and add the corresponding coordinates. So this will be simply the scalar product of uh, vector C and uh, uh, vector X, right? Which is, of course, just sum of C i X i. Uh, but this allows us uh, to avoid uh, these uh, sigmas and just write it as a, 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 scalar, a scalar product of C and X. And with our definition of uh, inequality, remember uh, for this inequality, this is not numerical inequality, this is inequality between vectors, right? Because the product of the matrix and the vector will be a vector. And this inequality is the partial ordering we just mentioned. It means that every coordinate of this product will be smaller or equal than uh, the corresponding coordinate of B. And similarly here, this means every coordinate of X has to be uh, bigger or equal than zero because zero here is a vector. And notice that's precisely this, right? This is each uh, entry, right? in the result of AX, right, each, this will be just i-th entry of the product of the matrix and the vector smaller than uh, B, and that's precisely so um, equivalent, right? So your typical um, linear programming solver will expect to see a vector of the coefficients um, in the objective plus another vector that gives you the bounds of inequalities and plus a matrix uh, of the coefficients that are obtained from these inequalities, right? When you represent uh, them as a, a matrix uh, times vector. So um, the solvers will expect to see input of uh, uh, this kind. Um, now, uh, we call a, uh, any value of the variables of the unknown that uh, you are trying to find so that the objective is optimized, either maximized or minimized, any value for which all the constraints are satisfied. So any value of this x vector, any x vector which satisfies that ax is smaller than b, right, in this vector inequality, is called a feasible solution. So just a solution, a feasible solution is any solution whatsoever which satisfies 
all the constraints. Um, so now uh, notice that in here we assume that all the constraints are inequalities, but in our first problem uh, with the food samples, we wanted that uh, some of the calories of all foods be exactly 2,000. So one of the constraints was an equality. Well, this is not, of course, a limitation because any equality of this form can be replaced by two inequalities. One, that this sum is bigger than bj, and the other, that this sum is smaller than bj. And if all the constraints have to be bigger or equal, of course, you will multiply this inequality with minus 1. So all the aij's will be uh, minus aij's. And this will flip into being bigger than bj. So essentially, both uh, of these inequalities are, are uh, equivalent to inequalities that are either both uh, like this or both like that, depending on uh, whether, you are whether you are maximizing the objective or minimizing the objective. So uh, this is uh, uh, easy to handle inequalities, sorry, equalities, simply by replacing them by um, two inequalities, right, of the same kind. Uh, so, also, uh, in general, a formulation of a problem as a linear program does not necessarily produce the non-negativity constraints for all of the variables, right? Um, we will see later examples where, in fact, we want to allow the variables to be both positive and negative. However, uh, the solvers expect all the variables to be, to assume to be positive, and this is easy to uh, work around this by the following trick. Instead of a single variable that can be both positive and negative, you, you introduce two variables. So xj will be replaced by two variables, uh, xj prime and xj star, where now these two variables are in fact required both to be positive. But we don't say which one is bigger, right? So in this way, even though both variables have to be positive, the, this uh, expression can be both positive and negative. So if you replace everywhere xj by this difference, uh, you get the same effect that uh, if xj could be both positive and negative, while um, keeping the condition that all the variables are uh, positive. Now, also, in some problems, well, especially approximation problems that uh, we will see uh, later, um, the problems are naturally translated into constraints of the form that the absolute value of Ax should be smaller than b, not just uh, b. So, um, but this also poses no problem because we can replace such constraints with two linear constraints. Oops, this is a mistake and I corrected it, but somehow the server didn't update. Uh, uh, the slides. So instead of A here, it should be X. Um, and uh, also here, X. Sorry about that. I am on the, the thing that is on the web was in fact, uh, but probably the server didn't update the, uh, the files yet. Uh, so uh, you can replace these by AX less than B and also minus AX less than B because absolute value of x will be smaller than y if and only if uh, um, 
x is smaller than y and also minus x is smaller than y because these two inequalities exactly hold uh, if and only if absolute value of x is uh, smaller uh, than y. Okay, so the standard form uh, would be uh, maximize uh, uh, CT, C transpose, right, just to make this into a row vector times x, subject to AX less than B and X is bigger uh, than uh, zero. So let us look at a concrete example. Assume that you want to maximize this expression, right? Subject to the constraints uh, given by these linear inequalities, right? Uh, so let us now think uh, how large can be the value of the objective without violating the constraints, right? So we want to kind of get a, a handle on how big this can be if these linear combinations all have to be smaller than the numbers on the right. Well, it's easy to see that if we add the first two inequalities, what do we get? We get 3x1 plus 3x2 plus 8x3 is, must be smaller than 54. But let's now look, but look at our objective. Our objective has the coefficients that are big, that are smaller or equal than the corresponding coefficients uh, on the left-hand side here. And this is why uh, it's good to have assumption that uh, all the variables are positive, right? Um, because it allows reasoning like this, right? If all the variables are positive, then this expression must be larger than that expression because three is bigger or equal than three here. This three is bigger than one and this eight is bigger than two. So we can conclude that this expression, which is our objective, must be smaller than 54. So if you, uh, if you look for the values that maximize this, if all the constraints are satisfied, you will definitely get a result that is smaller or equal than 54, right? Now one might say, well, <clears throat> maybe we can get a tighter bound, a smaller uh, right-hand side bound, a tighter bound for this by taking some different, maybe I should have summed up the first uh, uh, and the third, or uh, taking any linear combination of these guys. So, to do uh, this, so the idea is, uh, can I find multipliers for the first equation, for the first inequality, multiplier for the second, and multiplier for the third inequality, so that when I sum them up, I get a tight, as tight as possible bound on the right, uh, a small number, Right? while still it holds that this linear combination will dominate the objective. So, right? so now I am trying, just like in this example, rather than just summing these two inequalities, I want to kind of tweak them a little bit by multiplying them with certain coefficients <coughs> to get a tighter estimate. Maybe I can bring down this 54 uh, to see uh, to get a tighter estimate what this maximum might be. So if we try to do this, right, if you multiply the first inequality by y1, you get this on the left, and on the right you get 30y1. Then you multiply the second inequality by y2, third inequality by y3, and now you just sum them up. And if you factor out uh, um, X's on the left, right, you get this expression X1 that multiplies 
y1 plus 2y2 plus 4y3. And similarly for uh, x2 and for x3. And you get that this must be smaller or equal than the sum on the right-hand side, which is this, right? Now, if I ensure that this coefficient is smaller than, sorry, is larger than the coefficient in the objective, or larger or equal, and this linear combination is larger or equal than one, the, the coefficient in front of x2, and the third um, linear combination is uh, larger or equal than two, then this will dominate uh, the objective and be, and which, which will cause, right, that, uh, uh, that the objective is smaller or equal than, um, uh, than this expression, right? So once again, uh, we got this just by multiplying these uh, uh, linear combinations by y1, y2, and y3, summing up this, right? Now, if we impose the condition that this is bigger than 3, right, then coefficient in front of x2 is bigger than 1, and coefficient in front of x3 is bigger than 2, right? Then I am guaranteed that uh, the objective is smaller or equal than this linear combination. And this linear combination, in turn, is smaller or equal than this expression, right? That is on the uh, right-hand side. Because this dominates this. This dominates our uh, objective, thus uh, this, by transitivity, uh, this uh, expression will dominate our objective. So what did we actually accomplish? We had initially a problem to maximize this subject to these constraints, and in order to optimally um, estimate this, how large it can be. We are looking for y's so that this expression, which will be the bound for this, is as small as possible, while these constraints that will force the, um, the linear combination to be larger than the objective um, should be true. And it looks like we didn't accomplish anything, right? Because we reduced a problem to maximize one linear expression subject to some linear inequalities to a problem of minimizing another linear expression subject to another set of inequalities. But actually, this was not in vain uh, because uh, remember uh, the, the, our max flow problem. How did we find max flow? When did Ford Falkerson algorithm stop? When the flow through the network became equal to what? to the capacity of minimal cut. And this is absolutely exactly the same situation because our simplex method will try in steps to maximally increase this and it will know when to stop by computing the corresponding values for uh, the this problem, which is called the dual problem for P, and it will stop precisely when this expression, which needs to be minimized, is equal to this expression that needs to be maximized. So let me just show you the situation. Um, okay, here it is. So. These will be feasible solutions. These will be the solutions 
for the values that has to be maximized. These will be the solutions for the dual problem that have to be minimized. If you find a solution, just any feasible solution, that is who's, uh, so that the objective is equal to the value of the objective of the dual problem, this can only mean that you simultaneously maximized the original objective while minimizing the, uh, the dual objective, just as it was in the, uh, in the uh, in case with max flow um, mean cut. And in fact, uh, we will show <coughs> that max flow mean cut is just a spatial special case of a linear program. So actually, it's not an analogy. It's actually exact uh, uh, same thing. Uh, max flow mean cut is literally just uh, one special case of a linear program and uh, it's uh, dual. So just keep in mind, so trying to maximize this expression, the original objective, we try to do that by forming linear combination of these inequalities such that the corresponding linear combination on the right is as small as possible because you want to ensure if you want to get as tight upper bound for this as possible, right? So um, these two problems, the, the second problem is called the dual of the first problem. So now we can do as an exercise, let's now take this problem, the dual, and try to find its dual, right? So if we want to find the dual problem for this problem. So how do we do that? Again, we are looking this time for Zs that multiply this so that this uh, linear combination is as large as possible because this will be the lower bound for the objective, right? So how do we do that? Well, we have to have the, uh, we, um, we multiply the inequalities here this one by Z1, by Z2, by Z3, and we sum them up and take out Ys, Y1, take out Y2, and take out Y3, and lo and behold, you can uh, check that you get uh, these uh, inequalities, right? Just by multiplying the first with Z1, second with Z2, and the third with Z3. Okay, if you now sum them up, you get this expression that has to be bigger or equal than the sum on the right-hand side, right? So if we choose the multipliers so that this is uh, uh, smaller than 30, uh, this is smaller than 24, and this is smaller than 36, why do we choose that? because the objective of the dual problem is 30y1, 24y2, plus 36y3. So the first multiplier should be smaller than 30, second multiplier smaller than 24, and third multiplier smaller than 36, right? Um, then we will have that this linear, uh, in uh, this sum, this linear combination is in fact smaller than this because each multiplier is smaller or equal than the corresponding multiplier to the right. Right, so combining this, you will get that uh, uh, by just by transitivity, right, that uh, 3z1 plus uh, z2 plus 2z3 right, is smaller than um, the corresponding um, expression 
on the right hand side. So let's, to summarize, what did we get? We got that we have to maximize this objective subject to these linear inequalities, right? But notice that's precisely the starting problem, except that instead of x's, we have z's. So if you take dual problem of a dual, you get back the original problem p. So it's not that p star is dual, just the dual of p. It is also that p is a dual of p star, right? So there, it's a symmetric relationship. They are uh, duals of uh, each other. So, and as I mentioned, the um, algorithms that search for optimal solution for the original problem simultaneously search for the solutions of dual problem and they stop when the value of the original objective becomes equal to the value of the dual objective. Right, okay, so this is now a good moment to pause and take a short break. And then we will see how this is related to Max flow. <clears throat>